time for us to begin the chaos part of the course. Are you ready? Okay, so um, I want to begin with some video and also discussion. Could I have your attention? Much better, thank you. So we're going to discuss a um, chaotic water wheel. And so I've given you a handout to, if you want to make notes on it or something. Um, first, I'll try to indicate how it works by pointing at this diagram up here. But then uh, I have a video, really a cheesy amateur hour video of the style that I showed a couple of lectures ago. And um, so you'll see the water wheel in action doing its thing. But OK, so to indicate a little bit of what you're looking at, I'll be referring to various parts of it. The whole thing is the water wheel. By the way, it doesn't look like a water wheel that you're used to, you know, that for uh, irrigation or something, you know, where the wheel would be in the vertical plane and water would be poured in on the side of such a wheel. For this water wheel, it sits on a tabletop and as you can see, it's tilted. It has this, um, you can sort of adjust this screw here to tilt it up more or less. So that's one control parameter. There's a device in here which is a pump and it takes the water pumps it up through this manifold, which is a hose with lots of little holes in it, a perforated hose. So the water goes up through this manifold and then out through lots of little holes. You can see it dripping here into various chambers, which are around the rim of the wheel. So these chambers are little plexiglass chambers. They're walled off. The reason is we're trying to make the flow as simple as possible. We, we want the flow to just be vertically downward through each chamber and for the chambers not to communicate with each other, which they don't because of the walls. So anyway, the water pours in here at a uniform rate and um, enters these chambers, which then get slightly filled up with water. Meanwhile, because the whole thing is a wheel, it starts getting top heavy. You know, like if it didn't turn at all, the wheel would just have a lot of water up here and it would be kind of like an inverted pendulum. Can you understand what I mean? that it's got a lot of water up here. It doesn't like that. So it's going to want to tend to either rotate this way or the other way. And um, meanwhile, water is still coming in, filling up chambers that were previously empty. So that's the setup. And, the, and then the issue is, as a function of various parameters, like uh, there's a, a break on here that we can set that controls how much friction there is in the wheel. So as a function of the break, that's the easiest control parameter to change. Does the wheel just rotate uniformly in one direction? Does it rotate back and forth periodically? Does it behave chaotically or what? Yes? Does water ever leave the wheel? Water does not ever leave the wheel. This is a whole self-contained system. Now, actually, that isn't literally true. There are times when, like any device, it acts finicky. So if it gets stuck for some reason, water will start burbling up over the top and spilling onto the table. But that's not supposed to happen. If it's properly oiled and everything, it's all self-contained and there won't be any spilling. If you wanted to make one of these at home, by the way, this is a pretty nicely made machine, as you'll see. That, um, it, it exists at MIT. Uh, it was designed by a professor of fluid dynamics there named Willem Malkus. And he had a technician named Ed who made it. So I used to work with Ed each year, and he would fix things about the wheel to make it look nice. Um, but if you wanted to simulate it at home, you could just get a bunch of cups. Those would play the role of the chambers. You could put the cups around on the rim, tape them onto a device called a Lazy Susan, which you might have used um, on your kitchen table. Or, you know, like at a Chinese buffet, they sometimes have a nice big plate that will rotate around. So anyway, you put these cups around the rim, and then you put a hose or a faucet and just start pouring water in there. You have to tilt it a little. And then that will be your chaotic water wheel. But it'll be a mess. The water will spill all over the place. So this is much more um, organized. But that's the general idea. Is there another question about it? Oh, let me show you the video of it operating. And um, then maybe it'll be clearer what you're seeing. In the video, the water is colored green, not because of anything about the hydraulic system at MIT, but just we, we put food coloring in there so that you could see it better. 
Oh, now I'm just going to have to pause for a second because um, I want to put my microphone near the speakers. This is our technology here. <laughs> Actually, I think I'll take the whole thing off. So that, oh, look at that. We can edit this out later. <laughs> So you can um, watch this on YouTube if you want. As you can see, Strogat's nonlinear. All right, are we ready, Mr. Cameraman? Here we go. This is a video about the uh, Malchus water wheel designed and built by Will and Malchus at MIT. I'm Steve Strogatz and I'm Howard Stone. I'll be doing most of the narration here and Howard is going to work the video camera. Now, uh, first let me show you a little about this water wheel. All right, if I turn it on, then you'll see that water comes out and uh, goes into many chambers around the rim of the wheel. This manifold pumps the water, the water is pumped up through here, comes out through these nozzles into these chambers, and notice that the chambers have little holes in them and that's why the water drained out. By the way, uh, the water has been colored green with food coloring so you can see it. Now, let me uh, show you some solutions here, some of the behavior of this wheel. Uh, first, well, I have two control parameters I can play with. One is I could turn this screw, which would prop the wheel up more, and uh, that would effectively change gravity. The other is that there's a brake here, which I can tighten or loosen, which changes the uh, coefficient of rotational friction. So let me now just set the brake in a certain place, and uh, I'll show you a particular type of behavior. With any luck, this will settle into a uniformly rotating solution. Okay, now there was nothing special about rotating it in that direction. Notice that everything is symmetrical. The water is coming in symmetrically at the top, unlike a normal water wheel where the water would come in on the side. So I should be able to get it to rotate in this direction too, in a steady way, a uniform way. Uh, and it seems like that's more or less happening here. True? Yeah. Okay, Howard believes it. But now let me change the parameters to one where um, those parameters were such that this uniform rotating solution was stable. But that's not always the case. Now if I tighten the brake a little bit to here, uh, I should be able to see a complicated motion in which there are reversals, um, irregular and unpredictable reversals of the wheel. Okay, so so far it's just rotating to the right. Well, not uniformly. Certainly not uniformly. And uh, now it's drawn back to the left. Let's see, will it go to the right? Now it goes to the right. Well, now it's going to go to the right again. No, it goes back to the left. All right, you're right there, left. Ah, yes. All right. Can we ever get it to go twice in the same direction? Has it done that yet? Oh, no. Even at the very beginning. At the beginning, maybe. Come on, go over the top. Next time, well. Not quite. And made it too tight. Yeah. Let me try no, make no, give it, it, give it one more. Give it one more. One more? Yeah. You see, if the brake is set too tight, it goes into a simpler motion, which is just a uh, once to the left, once to the right, once to the left, once to the left, uh, the right. So we were hoping to get a chaotic solution where it has irregular reversals. Maybe I can get that by loosening it a little bit. Reversing. 
It went twice before. Yeah, but... Oh, and there it goes twice in that direction. Okay, this is better. Now, you might want to mention it's a mechanical analog. Well, yes, this is a uh, mechanical analog for the famous chaotic system known as the Lorentz system, um, discovered by Professor Lorenz also at MIT in the 60s. To see the uh, analog, roughly, physically speaking, you can think of the wheel as um, a single convection cell, and the rotation of the wheel is like the rotation of the convection cell. It's the difference, though, is that the driving here is the water inflow, whereas in the convection problem, it's um, temperature gradients. Actually, this is an exact analog, and uh, for a derivation of that connection, you can look at uh, my book on nonlinear dynamics and chaos for the chapter on the Lorentz equations. Well, okay, that's the Malchus water bill. So as you can see with a live demonstration, there's always this danger that it's not going to work right. And in that case, we did observe something that we didn't intend to show, which was this kind of pendulum back and forth, left, right motion. But that's interesting too. So now, in case you were thinking chaos was going to be some dramatic thing, I, that may have dispelled that notion. It's not that interesting, really, what you saw. It's just some kind of oscillation. But what's hard to predict about it is, is it going to go right or left on the next turn? Um, or maybe 10 oscillations from now, which way will it be going? So um, what I want to do next is, well, let's see. First, did you want to ask anything about what you observed? Comment on it at all? The, the, the claim is that I cheated somehow? Go ahead. What's the argument? The claim is that it was cheating to do this in the middle of the experiment, that I should have just set the control parameter exactly right to begin with, and then just demonstrated that it can behave chaotically. Yeah. Yes. That would be more, what, more elegant, more convincing? Yeah. <laughs> OK. <laughs> yes, it probably would have. Um, I don't think it matters doesn't really matter where you start, but you feel that somehow I kind of biased it to be chaotic by doing it in the middle or something. Yeah. Um, it's not true. It's, I mean, if I had changed the brake back, it would have gone back into its simple behavior. It may not be obvious, though. It's not convincing from what I showed. I agree. Yes? So the question is, what happens if you reduce the amount of tilt? Would that be equivalent to just reducing the amount of flow needed to get it to go chaotic? Uh, there are different effects, and I don't exactly know what would happen, but I don't think they're exactly, you know, one is equivalent to the other. So there really, in principle, are these different parameters. There's the flow rate, the tilt, the brake. Um, you could also change the position of the manifold. So instead of making it symmetrical at the top, you could put it a little bit off to the side, biasing one rotation over the other. So there are various things you can do. Um, but what I guess I want to do then is write down the governing equations for this wheel. And the reason we're spending time on the wheel is that, as mentioned in the video, it's an exact mechanical analog of this really famous, maybe the most famous chaotic system, the Lorenz equations. And I just think it's very interesting to see the, the Lorenz equations pop out of the physics of this wheel. Um, it also is a good exercise in seeing why are we studying ordinary differential equations that are such low dimensional systems, two or three dimensional. What does it have to do with science? Well, you'll see that here we're going to take 
uh, a couple of partial differential equations that describe the wheel, and through a miracle, they end up reducing to three ordinary differential equations. So that's the connection, to see how ODEs come out of more physically um, plausible models. Okay, so I don't think I need this screen anymore. Now this derivation that I'm about to give of the Lorenz equations is, is a pretty long affair. And if you know how to do fluid mechanics, a lot of it will be familiar to you. If you've never studied fluid mechanics, um, well, then you'll learn some right now. <laughs> and you'll, I want to show every step because I know people come from different backgrounds. So chapter nine, the Lorenz system. And later on, I'll tell you stories about who Ed Lorenz was and what he was like and why his equations are so famous. But for now, let's just focus on this water wheel. So here's a little diagram of it, extremely schematic, where I'm short of showing the top view of the chambers. And think of the flow as uh, the water is coming in here at the top in the lab frame. Here's Q uh, inflow rate. And let's measure an angle theta going around like that, starting at 12 o'clock. So my notation will be that omega of t is the angular velocity of the wheel. And theta is the angle in the lab frame. That is, there are two ways you could think about the angle. You could go in the frame of the rotating wheel and talk about a particular place on a material point on the wheel co-moving with the wheel. I'm not doing that. Instead, I'm using an angle that is just defined in you know, the lab, and then the wheel moves around with respect to, to that. Um, theta equals zero would correspond to, as shown, 12 o'clock on an old analog clock in the lab frame. And Q of theta is our way of describing what the manifold is doing. So Q of theta tells us the rate at which water flows in above position theta. So the rate at which water is pumped in and of course it depends on theta because the nozzles, the little holes are distributed in theta. And in fact there's parts of the wheel that aren't getting any water pumped in because the manifold doesn't extend that far. It doesn't depend on time, it's a steady inflow. So that's that. Then we have the wheel's radius. And what I mean by that is, remember that the chambers around the rim were pretty thin. And so I'm not going to really distinguish between the inner radius and the outer radius of the chamber. Take it to be some nominal radius, maybe in the middle. Um, I mean, we're trying to approximate something that's supposed to be one dimensional, that is, it has no thickness. But in reality, it does. But ignore that effect. And finally, I have a, um, a function, m, that depends on both theta and t, which you could think of as that green distribution of water that you could see in the movie. That is, it's, it looked like a histogram showing where the water was. So this is the mass distribution of water around the rim. Um, where by that I mean that the mass between two angles, say theta 1 and theta 2, would be defined as the integral of this. It's really a mass density per unit angle. 
that is mass per unit angle. So I'm going to do m of theta t d theta integrated from theta 1 to theta 2. Maybe I should say that this derivation I'm about to give was worked out um, by my friend and colleague Paul Matthews when I was at MIT. He, was, he had a lot of background in fluid dynamics and he's the one who pretty much did this analysis first and then generously um, let me use it in this course. He was working with Professor Malkus who designed the wheel. Anyway, so um, the variables that we are going to be discussing, that is the things that depend on time, you can see are the angular velocity of the wheel and this mass distribution which changes over time. And so we want to write laws of motion or governing equations for those two. And so let's derive them. Well, all right, so the first one is an expression of conservation of mass, where here mass really means water, and um, to a fluid mechanician this will be a continuity equation. But anyway, so conservation of mass, here's what the answer will come out to be, that that's expressed by partial of m with respect to t is q minus a constant k times m minus omega partial m partial theta. And I want to derive this, though as I say it may be familiar if you, if you know how to think about such problems. So in this there are various terms. Um, let's see, so we have the inflow. That is, if I think about the mass in a given location in space at theta, how does that mass change? Well, water can be flowing in, or it could be draining out. So this is a drainage term, or a leakage, or whatever you want to call it. Remember that the chambers have holes at the bottom. And what we're assuming here, and what's pretty close to what happens in reality, that is, you can experimentally measure how fast does the water drain out of the chamber, what we're saying is it'll drain at a rate proportional to how much mass is in there. So proportional to its pressure head. Now people who know about drainage know that it can be more complicated than that depending on the size of the hole and what's going on at the hole. So this is a, the simplest possible model and it's not far from reality. Um, Malchus actually got his technician Ed to make it even closer to reality by attaching thin um, hoses, uh, thin, like little thin pipes at the bottom of the hole so that when the water flowed out it's really just doing simple pipe flow out of that hole. And that, that really will make this um, be correct. So okay, anyway, that's um, our approximation. And then this is a term that says that water can change in a given location in, in the lab because it's been transported into that location by the wheel rotating. That is, there might have been some water over here that then rotated into that angle theta. So this is a transport term. And so those are the, the physical ideas, but let's actually derive all that. So to derive it, we're going to consider some sector. Um, an angle theta 1 to theta 2 fixed in space. That is, it's some, something that looks like this around the rim. If you want, you can think of it as very small or it doesn't have to be. So this angle would represent theta 1. Actually, let's make this one theta 2. And then here's theta 1. And um, let me think about the total amount of mass of water in there. So big M refers to the mass. As we said, that's integral from theta 1 to theta 2 of M of theta t d theta. And it will change with time. 
for various reasons. So what happens in a time delta t? That is, since we're going to try to derive a differential equation for the change of this variable little m, let's think about what happens you know, between now and an instant later from now, this instant delta t later. Well, so what happens in that time? Um, the mass will change through various effects. That is, the change in mass will be approximately, first of all, proportional to the amount of time. And then there will be some mass that comes in. It'll, it'll be Q of theta, d theta, from theta 1 to theta 2. That is, this is the, so really, this Q is, is also a density. It's mass per angle that's flowing in. Um, integrated from theta 1 to theta 2. That'd be the total mass that came in due to the inflow. Then there's also the mass that drained out, which is integral from theta 1 to theta 2 km d theta. And then, so that's the rate at which it's draining out. And then there's the transport, which you can think of this way, that there might have been in this, well, in the time delta t, there'll be a little blob here that has a width omega delta t. That's the angle that would be traveled in time delta t. And if any mass was in here in time delta t, some of it will have rotated in, and then an equal angle amount of stuff will have rotated out. So you just have to think of how much mass was transported in and how much was transported out. There's also mass in here that's just rotating to a new position, but it's still in the sector, so it still counts. So it's only at the boundary that we have to pay attention to mass coming in and going out, and recognizing that here's um, theta 1, the mass that's coming in is the mass per unit angle at theta 1 times this little angle. Where here, I'm not paying attention to the fact that m of theta varies throughout this tiny region because it's so tiny. That is, well, this is an, another standard approximation that becomes exact in the, the limit that we're going to take. So that's the mass that's transported in. And then there's mass that leaves, which had uh, angular density m of theta 2. And then that's how wide that little patch was that goes out. So that's our, and that's, of course, those are outside the integral. Sorry, that's a big closed bracket there. So that was in and then out. All right, so do you buy that that's the change in mass? Now, we want to derive a, a partial differential equation from that. And so naturally, we're going to divide by t and then let delta t go to 0. Um, another thing is, though, notice that these are integrals with respect to theta, whereas these terms are not. So it's more convenient to make them also appear inside an integral. And we can do that by observing that m of theta 1 minus m of theta 2 can be written as integral of partial m with respect to theta d theta from theta 1 to theta 2. Um, except that's not quite right because there should be a negative sign. Right? That's the fundamental theorem of calculus. You're just integrating a derivative, so you get the value at the endpoints. And so then our system becomes um, delta m is approximately delta t times a big integral from theta 1 to theta 2, and then all the terms, q minus km and then minus omega partial m partial theta. Or notice that um, this is OK to include this last term, the omega, inside the integral, because omega doesn't depend on theta. 
right? Omega only depends on time, but it's the same for all positions on the wheel. It's a rigid wheel. And so finally, then you can divide by delta t and take the limit. And you get that m dot is this integral from theta 1 to theta 2, q minus km minus omega partial m partial theta d theta. Um, but also observe that m dot is, since big M is defined over here as the integral of little m, then m dot, you can take the, the time derivative inside the integral, and this becomes integral from theta 1 to theta 2 partial m with respect to t d theta. And um, the final bit in the argument is to say, well, theta 1 and theta 2 were completely arbitrarily chosen angles. So we could, you know, we could think of them as being very close together or whatever. And if this is true for all choices of theta 1, theta 2, then under continuity assumptions that we always make in applied math, at least in this part of applied math, then um, you can say the terms in brackets, the integrands must be equal. So that's how we get our first equation. So there it is. And, and that one I'm going to call equation one. So any question about that derivation? Yes? Slightly mathematical question. It's allowed. Um, the question was, why are we using a partial derivative with respect to time? In which expression are you concerned? This one? Or this one? This one is a total time derivative. This only depends on time. So that's why I wrote m dot. That, that means little d m dt. Because the theta part has been integrated out of big M. There is no theta dependence in big M. Um, but this one, little m, is a function of both theta and time. So I just mean the derivative with respect to time holding theta fixed. That's really all I mean. Is that the one that bothered you? Yes, or something else? Oh, you mean how did I take the time derivative of an integral? Yes, I mean, yes I'm using so-called Leibniz's rule. Yeah. That is, I, this expression um, over here is a function of time. And then I took total time derivative of it. But I guess you were bothered. Why did that total time derivative, when it came in here, become a partial derivative? Something like that. Yeah, because everything else is independent of t. Theta 1 and theta 2 are independent of t. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, there we go. And now we, we're not done because all we know so far is how m evolves. But we don't know how the angular velocity evolves, which remember is the other variable. So let's get an equation for, for the evolution of omega. So the second equation, then, is going to be essentially Newton's law, f equals ma. Um, but ex in this case, it will be expressed as a balance of torque and um, rate of change of angular momentum. So let us first suppose that the uh, moment of inertia of the wheel, which we're going to need if we think about torque balance. So I is the moment of inertia, and it depends on time.
Why does it depend on time? Because water, the amount of mass in the wheel is changing. Right? So there's mass distributed around the rim at a distance r from the center, but that amount of mass is changing. And so there's some contribution to the moment of inertia that's time dependent. There's also the fact that there's just the solid wheel, forget about the water, that also contributes to the moment of inertia. That does not change. But, but the, wheel, the water part does. Um, so then we have to say um, the time derivative of the angular momentum, that is to say I have I omega dot, that is dot of the whole product. It's not right to say I omega dot, meaning just dot the omega, because I also depends on time. So if I omega dot is, well, what are the torques on the wheel? One of them is just proportional to the angular velocity of the wheel. That's um, the brake causes that. The faster the wheel spins, the, the more rotational friction there is on the wheel due to the brake. So we're assuming that the, you know, just like friction of a moving object translating is proportional to how fast it's moving, similar things hold with rotation with the brake. So we're using this linear damping law from the brake. which again is a simple approximation, but this system is machined to have a very nice brake with viscous goop in there that acts as the brake. And um, so it really does work pretty well linearly with respect to omega. Then there's also something that drives the wheel, which remember, it's not just gonna damp out, it's turning. And the reason it's turning is that, as I said earlier, it's kind of top heavy. It has water on the top, so there's a gravitational torque that tends to make it turn. And so we have to calculate that. Uh, not torque, torque. But before I start getting into the torque due to gravity, I always have a little bit of a nervous, flinchy reaction at this point, because um, one year a student pointed out that there was yet another effect that I didn't think of and that Paul Matthews didn't think of either when he gave me these these derivations. And it, w it made me worry that the whole thing would be screwed up because of it. Um, can anyone think of something that's been left out? If not, it's, it's pretty subtle, don't worry about it, but I can, I'll just tell you what, there's one other effect that, that should be included. The inflow of the water, what about it? You're on the right track. Let's see, except at theta equals zero, it can exert torque. So um, something, well, I mean, we're going to exert torque how? I mean, we have the torque due to gravity. What's that? Slosh. So we put, remember, the question is, could there be slosh side to side? But we built the chambers with these little walls to, so that we're ignoring slosh. Okay, now there's all kinds of, good, people are getting agitated, yes? Centripetal force. Whoa, that's always a good all-purpose answer. <laughs> <laughs> but, but how is that going to, I don't think that's going to put a torque. You have a thought? Shearing, wow, every possible. But there may be other effects that we still, I, all right, here's the one I'm looking for. Um, that the water comes in with no angular momentum. It's just coming straight down out of the nozzle. It then gets spun up by being put into a spinning wheel, and when it leaves the wheel by draining out, it's leaving, carrying out angular momentum. So that is, if you draw one of these control volume pictures, of what angular momentum has come in or gone out of the control volume surrounding the wheel, water came in with no angular momentum and left with angular momentum, proportional to omega, right? Because it was spinning at speed omega when it left. And so, wonder of wonders, it's just another term proportional to omega. So it does not mess up the derivation. That is, this inertial damping due to this effect of angular momentum coming in coming in with zero and leaving with positive angular momentum 
or at least with non-zero angular momentum. That's an effect proportional to omega. So it just kind of redefines nu. It's now not just the break, but also this effect. So I don't want to get into it farther than that, because this is a, for, I'm not competent to. But um, this has been including both of those effects. So we'll say linear damping due to the break plus, I don't know what to call that effect, inertial damping or something of the type I just tried to explain. So years ago, a student named Chris Polhammer noticed that. Um, but then I think he also figured out that it, it wasn't a problem, that it doesn't cause trouble for us. OK, so now back to the torque due to gravity, uh, how to think about it. Well, let's again do our simplified top view picture where I have, um, like, let's look here at go over some distance theta. And then look at a tiny element of mass here, which occurs because of some thickness delta theta. Here's the blob of mass. And um, I want to think about what torque that puts on the, the wheel. So in a small sector d theta, the, um, the little mass in there would be d big M. That would be a little m d theta. And then the torque due to it would be, let's call it d tau, tau for torque, would be this little mass times g times the distance from the center r times sine of theta, which is a standard looking pendulum torque. Right? That is the maximum torque that this mass would put on is when theta is pi over 2. Just like if you're trying to hold up a heavy weight, it's hardest on your shoulder to do it when it's held out to the side. Right, where it's straight up, doesn't put a big torque. So, and, and also, we don't have a negative sign because this is not a restoring torque like uh, for a pendulum at the bottom. This is more like a pendulum inverted. So it's tending to drive the wheel. Now, in saying g, I should be careful. That g doesn't mean the usual g, the 9.8 meters per second squared, because remember from a side view that the wheel is tilted like this. due to um, that you know, stand that's sticking up. So the effective g in the plane of the wheel is not the real g, but it depends on this tilt angle. Let's call it alpha. Um, so the g effective, which is what I mean by g, is really the true gravitational acceleration g0, the 9.8 meters per second squared. Um, times the sine of alpha. So if the, if the wheel were flat on the table, there wouldn't be any of this effect. And if the wheel were straight up, you'd have the maximum effect. So anyway, from now on, I'm just going to call it g, but I really mean g effective. But we're not going to change alpha, so we don't have to worry about that. Anyway, so I have this torque due to this element. And then if I add up all of the little infinitesimal elements, the total torque due to the water will be 0 to 2 pi g r m of theta t sine theta d theta. That is, I've added up all those little ones. So there's my gravitational torque. And that goes in here. Any question about that derivation? Um, so let me then write the whole equation out. So where were we? We had I omega all dot. So that is d d t of I omega will be minus nu omega plus g and r are both constants. 
integral of m of theta t sine theta d theta, where I'm integrating over the whole wheel. So that I'll call equation two. And so that's an evolution equation for omega. But there's actually a simplification we can make that I want to make at this point, um, which is it's kind of annoying to think about the i depending on time. And actually, we can ignore that and pretend that i is constant. Now, why can we do that? The old argument that, that Will and Malchus told me when I first asked him about this was he said the wheel is much heavier than the water. But, but we can do better than that. Um, we can show that after a, after a reasonable finite amount of time, the um, I will actually approach a constant in time because the mass does. So it's just a fact that I of t approaches a constant as t goes to infinity. And what's interesting about this is that it doesn't depend on how chaotically the wheel is moving. The wheel could be still, or it could be rotating, or it could be you know, moving uniformly, or it could be moving chaotically. None of that matters. I of t always goes to the same constant. So even if omega of t is complicated, And so that's easy to see. I mean, if you're just thinking physically, it's obvious. Do you have the physical explanation? Well, I have a question. Oh, you have a question? Yes? No. No, because if the question was, as alpha goes to zero, shouldn't g approach g naught? No, because that, the wheel, this is supposed to be a side view of the wheel. If alpha is zero, the wheel would be flat on the table and it would have no inverted pendulum effect. A, a flat wheel would have no tendency to turn. Whereas a wheel in the vertical plane would have a tendency, would have the maximum. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So when alpha is pi over two, that's when it really acts like a water wheel you're used to that's standing straight up. Okay. But anyway, so um, why does I of t go to a constant? Let me first say it just intuitively. Because uh, think about like what happens in your bathtub if you leave the shower on, but you also leave the drain open. Then the water comes in, it starts filling up the bathtub, and at some point the water is going out through the drain as fast as it's coming in. And then everything stops changing. So when inflow equals outflow, the mass will not change, assuming you have a good enough drain and not a crazy powerful shower. So when, if inflow balances outflow, mass will stop changing. Maybe, maybe in the interest of time, um, I don't know, is that obvious enough? That is, transport doesn't change the mass. You can rotate the mass around. That doesn't change the mass in the wheel. If you look at the total mass in the wheel, um, it's going to obey m dot is the total inflow, q total, minus k times the total mass, which I claim is obvious because of this transport not changing the, um, the mass. Yes? You want me to derive that? No. No. Good. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. The question is, does the distribution of the water affect how fast it leaks out? I claim not really. Not, not the total mass. Yes. Right. So the blob, the, the chambers that are more filled will leak faster. But um, let's just, okay, so let's just look at this for a second. That is, if I have big M, well, its time rate of change is the integral of partial M partial T D theta from 0 to 2 pi. So I'm integrating over the whole wheel. Then I use my differential equation. So Q minus K little m minus omega partial m partial theta. D theta, I go from 0 to 2 pi. And so the thing is that the first term integrates to what I'm calling Q total. The second term 
Notice it says just m d theta, so that's just k times big M by definition of big M, right? And then the third term integrates to zero because it's going to be minus omega dm d theta d theta from zero to two pi, and so this is just m at two pi minus m at zero, which by con you know the fact that it's a, a wheel, the mass at two pi is the same as the mass at zero. This is zero. So this, anyway, these are the only two terms that contribute. And then, um, as you can see, this is a first order linear differential equation that has exponential decay to a steady state value of um, Q total over M. Sorry, Q total over K. As T goes to infinity, actually, In practical terms, if you think about the time scale, it'll be set by this constant k. And so for times much greater than 1 over k, you're effectively at infinite time. So as long as the time is large compared to 1 over k, this damping time, um, then you can ignore this changing i of t. And just think of i of t from now on as a constant. Oh, I guess I should also say I depends on, the, you know, if you think what is the formula for I, the moment of inertia of the wheel will be um, all the mass due to the water is at the same radius. So it all contributes MR squared. And then plus whatever the moment of inertia of the wheel itself is. Um, this is, I don't know what, some parallel axis theorem or something. I guess is that what I'm using? Yeah. So, but anyway, yes. So I'm worried about this the second term in the convective derivative. Second term in the convective derivative. So if you're doing the total derivative, you get the omega. Does that end up being the derivative? What? Sorry, you're worried about convective derivative? This is not a convective derivative. This is a DDT. Well, remember everything, theta is defined in the lab frame. So we're not doing an, I mean, this is a description at a given theta. All right, I think, I don't think anything's, the only thing that's sort of like convective, I mean, this, this term has some of that effect in it. Yeah. Right. But I think that's the only one that we need. That's just due to the transport, the wheel rotating. This is why we're in the lab frame rather than following a particle of water. Yeah, we don't want to do it that way. So, okay, so anyway, that, the point there was that I goes to a constant. And I'm from now on going to just call it I. And so equation two then becomes just I omega dot, where I is now regarded as constant, is minus nu omega plus gr integral m of theta t sine theta d theta from 0 to 2 pi. And so that, okay, it's only valid at large time, but as I say, the time doesn't have to be that large, just big compared to 1 over k. So this is going to be now called equation 3. I, I need to do this obsessive numbering because it'll be helpful to refer to them this way. Okay, so having gotten the governing equations now, that is 1 and 3, um, well, Let's think about them, because they're a lot hairier than anything we've done in this course so far. Maybe I should write them both down in one place so we can stare at them and, and observe a little bit about what's happening in them. So what were they? One was... this one dm dt is q minus km minus omega partial m partial theta. And three was i omega dot is minus nu omega plus gr integral m of theta t sine theta d theta. All right, so let's behold those equations. Now, how horrible are they? Um, okay, this first equation is a partial differential equation, but 
You want to think in terms of linear or nonlinear. That's always the most important issue. So is it linear or nonlinear? What would you say? Linear. Because that m is only appearing to the first power. However, what about this term, omega dm d theta? First power of m, but don't forget omega is a variable. So this is actually a quadratically nonlinear term. This is like omega m, kind of. Okay, so there's a quadrat. This is this is not linear. Nonlinear due to the quadratic term. But that's the only nonlinearity in that equation. Um, and you see, it's br it shows how omega is entering the m equation. So there's coupling between the omega equation and the m equation through that term. Now what about the omega equation, linear or nonlinear? This one is linear, because omega and m are only appearing to the first power only. And there's no products or any other hairier stuff with omega and m getting together. Um, so this is linear. Th this is the only nonlinearity right there. One, and that's as mild as a nonlinearity can be. It's a second power to quadratic nonlinearity. So it's not that bad. On the other hand, this is a kind of equation of a type you may have never studied before because it's a differential equation with an integral in it. So it's called an integral differential equation. And so you have an integral differential equation where notice that the m enters the omega equation right here. And as I said, omega enters the m equation up there. So it's a coupled set of a, a partial differential equation, nonlinear, coupled to an integral differential equation. So when you say it all like that, you think, OK, let's go home. <laughs> but no, 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 we're not going anywhere. Um, not yet. <laughs> because actually, through the wonders of Fourier analysis, we can reduce this tremendously. And what will pop out is the Lorentz system, three ordinary differential equations. And they'll be nonlinear because of this. They'll have a vestige of that quadratic nonlinearity. But so I really think this is delightful, which is why I'm going into all this detail. So let's see if I can delight you with Fourier magic. That is, um, what we're going to do now is a standard technique called deriving amplitude equations. Um, and the amplitude refers to amplitudes of coefficients. You know, we're going to write a Fourier series with amplitudes, and those amplitudes will change in time. So to solve this, this is the only place in the course where you need to know a little Fourier analysis, and you don't need to know much. All you need to know is that um, since m is 2 pi periodic in theta, because of the wheels, geometry, um, we're going to write m as a Fourier series. So we'll write m of theta of t is, I'm oh, sorry, m of theta and t is a sum over n. So n labels what I'll call the modes, the harmonics. So there's an amplitude a n of t of a sine n theta term. And another amplitude we'll call bn of t um, cosine n theta. That is, all I'm saying is at any fixed time, m is a periodic function in theta. So it has some amplitude and for the sine and cosine of n theta. And those depend on the time that we're taking the snapshot. So that's why it's a n of t and b n of t. And so that's our really no assumption at all. That just comes from Fourier's work that you can do that. So I'm going to take that and then plug it into my equations and see what happens. Um, you might be wondering, why do I have a term a0? Because after all, sine of 0 theta is 0. I don't need it. Uh, obviously, it doesn't mean anything. But all the rest are meaningful. And it just lets you write the equations a little nicer if you write it this way. So now what we want to do is derive equations. They're just going to be ordinary differential equations for the a n and b n where n will go from um, 0 up to infinity. So I'm going to get an infinite system of ordinary differential equations. 
But you'll see that three of them decouple from all the rest, and those three are the Lorentz system in disguise, the, the water wheel version of the Lorentz system. So here we go. Um, we have to also write, notice that this Q, remember Q was the inflow due to the manifold, the nozzles, and that depends on theta too, so uh, let Q of theta be, well, how about we write it as sum of Qn cosine n theta. So what about that? Why, why did I write it like that? What happened to the sine terms? Why aren't there any sine terms? Yes, Alex? It's an even function in theta. Why? Right, because of the, the, we said that we're going to add the water symmetrically at the top. So if we had put the water off to the side, then there would be some sine theta, and that makes an interesting problem, but we're not going to do that now. Let's just do the simplest case where it is symmetrically added at the top. That is, it was symmetric about theta equals zero. All right, so um, now we're going to take these Fourier series and plug them in here and see what happens. And you'll need some room to do that, but there's no real brain power involved. Just calmly substitute and don't screw up the derivatives. All right, so here goes number one with the substitution for m. Number one becomes partial with respect to t of the sum of a n sine n theta plus b n cosine n theta equals minus omega partial with respect to theta of um, sum of a n sine n theta plus b n cosine n theta. I'm not writing this. I mean, all these sums are from 0 to infinity. Um, then plus q n cosine n theta. And then um, minus k times m. So that would be minus k sum a n sine n theta plus b n cosine n theta. Okie dokie. Now what? So then, when you calculate all this, you're going to get a bunch of terms. You get two Fourier series on both sides of the equal sign. And there's this principle with Fourier series. You've probably learned if you studied this that um, sine, the, the, there's a, you remember learning about orthogonality, right? That sine n theta, okay, you, you know what I'm talking about then. So these, this set of functions have nice orthogonality properties that allow us to say, actually we don't even need orthogonality, just the linear independence of the sets of functions sine n theta and cosine n theta mean that we can, um, we'll calculate the coefficients of sine n theta on both sides and set them equal. And likewise, we'll match the cosine and theta terms on both sides. Yes? Sure, the question is, could we do it with complex form? Yes, absolutely. If you'd rather write your Fourier series with complex notation, you could do it that way. Um, so, all right, but anyway, let us uh, look at the sine and theta terms on both sides. So matching the sine and theta, what do we, how can we get sine and theta on the left? Well, look at this first term. D D T of this, that's going to produce A N dot. Right? The sine N theta, these thetas are independent of T. T and theta are independent variables here. So um, I just get A N dot. 
and I can't generate any other sine n thetas. Then I go equals. Now, how can I get sine n theta over here? Well, OK, I have dd theta. The only way to get sine n theta is when the dd theta hits the cosine n theta. Right? That will generate a minus sine n theta times a chain rule factor of n. So we'll get, and then there's this omega sitting outside, and then the coefficient bn that goes along with the n. So we get n omega bn is the coefficient of sine n theta in this term. And there's no sine n theta in this. And then there's one sitting right here that's minus kan. Done. Any question about how we did that? Yes? The coefficients do not depend on time. That's the point. That, that when you write a Fourier series, all the theta dependence is in the sine n theta and the cosine n theta. And then the amplitudes depend on time because that's it. That's, that's the beauty of writing it this way. Any other question? No. All right. So then we also have to write down the cosine n theta terms. And to match those, well, so same kind of reasoning leads you to bn dot equals minus n omega a n plus q n. Right, this q n enters here for the cosine n theta term minus k b n. And all this is supposed to be true for n equals 0, 1, 2, and so on. So we have this doubly infinite set of ordinary differential equations. Now for the a's and the b's. And also don't forget omega depends on time. So I guess I want one more equation, right? Because I have to, so far all I did was equation 1. But now I have to pop the Fourier series into equation 3. And then we'll, be, we'll have our, all our... Uh, governing equations written in this new language. So now substitute the Fourier series for m of theta t into that torque balance equation 3. And I don't know if I should give it away, but I'm going to. This is where the great thing happens. So watch. 3. 3 becomes i omega dot is minus nu omega plus gr integral 0 to 2 pi. Now I have to substitute that Fourier series. So sum of a n sine n theta plus b n cosine n theta times sine of theta, right? This term. Sine of theta due to the pendulum action, the, the torque being proportional to sine theta, sine theta d theta. There, now you see it, right? Isn't that great? Well, OK, what is it that we're seeing, you want to say, Cody? The orthogonality is right there staring us in the face. That all these functions are orthogonal to sine of theta and all have zero integral except for one of them, which is sine theta. So the only contribution is the term that would be gr um, integral. There would be one of them, just the term b, yeah, no, a, a1, which depends on time but not theta, sine squared theta d theta. And then earlier when we talked about averaging theory for oscillators, we said we're never going to do this integral the rest of our lives. We know that the average of sine squared theta is a half times the, the length of the interval that we're integrating over as long as, like, if we go over a full cycle as we are here, 0 to 2 pi. So we're going to get a half times 2 pi. Um, that is, this term is going to equal uh, a half times 2 pi times gr times this function a1, which depends on time. So this simplifies to pi gr a1. 
So let's write that more cleanly. Actually, maybe, well, maybe I'll do it over here since it's a kind of a convenient thing. I already have these first system of differential equations. Adding the last one gives me I omega dot is uh, minus nu omega plus pi g r a1. So let's put a big box around this. And now that system, at first glance, is still scary because it's sort of doubly infinite plus one dimensional. But do you see the great thing? Let's, let's just look at it carefully. Um, it says, oh, let's think about how omega evolves. Like suppose you were asking, I know the current state. What will happen in the next time unit, or at delta t later? To update omega, I need to know omega, and I need to know a1. But if then, how, how do I update a1? I mean, this sort of puts the spotlight on a1, right? How does a1 evolve? a1, think of n equals 1, will evolve based on knowing about omega and b1 and itself. And b1 would evolve based on omega a1 and b1. Do you see that those three, a1, b1, and omega, have decoupled from everything else? So let's go to the hallowed third board here. We are left with um, the fact that omega a1 and b1 decouple exactly from all the other, um, from all the a n b n's with n greater than 2 or equal to 2. And we're left with this little three-dimensional system for a1 dot is, well, we're using n equals 1, so it says omega b1 minus k a1. b1 dot is o minus omega a1 plus q1 minus kb1. And omega dot is, let's write it this way, we divide through by i. So minus nu over i omega plus pi g r over i a1. And so there's a beautiful little three-dimensional system of differential equations that um, is an, a system we want to analyze in the next lecture. We'll think of those as the water wheel equations. You could ask, before we get into the details of this system, but what about all the other A's and B's? Well, yeah, what about them? Um, look at them. So like if you look at any AN or BN for N greater than 2 or equal to 2, they also, you know, AN only depends on BN and itself and omega. So you can think of it this way. Here's this little engine, this little machine that runs on its own, this three-dimensional machine, and it generates an omega of T. Once I get that omega of T, I can feed it in here as just a known function of t, and then watch the a, n, and b, n evolve while being driven by omega of t. So th that is, the a, n, and b, n obey a two-dimensional, non-autonomous system driven by omega of t, but they don't feed back into this three-dimensional system down here. So really, this is the heart of it. We're going to study this system, and um, this is I mean, is basically equivalent to the Lorenz equations that are much more famous. Um, and then we will eventually drop the water wheel and just talk about the Lorenz system. But okay, anyway, I hope you, this gives you some physical feeling about what the chaos is, is sort of like. Let's leave it there.